Okay, part two of the DBSA uh, interview. We're doing two parts. I told you I was going to get to Michelle the Angel. Um, and I am. Um, she is the president of MAB Consulting Services. Correct. And she is a doll. <laughs> Uh, I don't, you know, I don't know much about Michelle, but I'm going to learn a little bit about her. The only thing I know is that uh, when DBSA says that she's incredible and, you know, you should interview her, I'm like, I know she is already without even meeting her. So here we are, Michelle Bibby, how are you? I'm doing great. You feel good? I feel good. You look great. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. And so do you. Thank you. Thank my red shirt. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what does, I'll, I ask you the same first question. What does MAB stand for? Uh, Michelle Alexander Bibby. Oh, so that's my initials. Oh, my goodness. MAB Consulting Services. What's that's, wrong, baby? that's me. So um, I don't know much about you. So, where are you from? Uh, born in Sacramento, yeah. so... Oh, uh, Sacramento. Yeah, absolutely. Spent exactly one year in Sacramento. And uh, my parents got divorced. My mom went back to Houston, which is home. Uh, so, I grew up in Houston. Um, where my wife was from. Yeah, we were talking about that. Wow. Yeah, grew up in Houston, graduated uh, from high school, Went to Austin to attend the University of Texas, uh, graduated from UT, went back home to Houston to attend law school, and... Um, you wanted to be a lawyer? I had always wanted to be an attorney from when I was in elementary school. Wow. I actually wanted to be a judge. Oh, really? So um, I get into law school. I'm towards the end of my first year of law school when I went into mental health crisis. And so this was in 1985. Yeah. And so um, in 1985, um, doctors, um, family members just did not have a lot of um, hopes or expectation yeah, for yeah. people living with a mood disorder. Right. So <clears throat> I had doctors say things to me, um, psychiatrists, like, you know, it's amazing that you graduated from college, but you'll never be able to finish law school, and you probably need to just get a very small job that's not stressful, and you might be able to hold down a job like that. But, you know, basically, like, best of luck to you. Really? Yeah. And what kept you going? Well, um, <clears throat> there's, there's a part of me that, um, likes to prove people wrong. Yeah. So, yeah. um, I was highly motivated to, you know, give it my best effort. Um, and I felt like I had just intrinsically setting the mood disorder aside, what it took to be successful in life. And, you know, even if I wasn't going to get a chance to finish law school, I, I believed in my own ability and resolve. Wow. Now, you, any mental health in your family or you or? No, no um, evidence or presence of mental health conditions Nothing. in my family of and origin. And you just wanted to be in. And which, which made it very interesting, uh, when I first went into mental health crisis, the um, psychiatrist that um, did my intake uh, was a, a black female psychiatrist, which was very important because back in 1985, and there's still some truth to it today, people presenting with mood vulnerability who are black yeah. are far more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. 
Oh, really? So with me not having any evidence of mental health um, conditions in my family, I really give that psychiatrist a lot of credit because she talked to me for hours and hours and hours to finally come up with, you know, you have a mood disorder. Um, But it is quite common for people with lived experience with mental health conditions not to get the correct diagnosis Uh, initially. Yes. And um, that can have a very negative impact on a person's trajectory um, in their life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I was lucky, like I when I talked to Michael about when the, Dr. Noonan uh, said I was manic depressive, he was right. Because he could have been wrong. Yeah. But he was right. And then what happened with me was uh, I started taking lithium, and then I got off lithium and had another, another nervous break then. Yeah. So every time I get off my medication, I, I'm... I'm but I've been straight now for 30 years. Straight, nice, no, no breakdowns. Just a lot of bad anxiety, you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, in the black community, is it like the Spanish community where there's a stigma? Yeah, there's a lot of stigma um, in the black community. And, um, well, you know, there's stigma in society, period, I know, I know. related to mental health conditions. Um, I like to say there is... There's a lack of insight, yes. um, acknowledgement, and recognition of mental health conditions in the black community. So there's a need for more education, and peer support is a great avenue to um, invite people in in a way that is not pathologizing them. Yeah. So it's just saying if you identify in yourself some type of mood challenge, come check out a DBSA peer support group. Um, you may connect with it. So, you know, you don't, like, we're not checking people's diagnosis at the door no. of the peer support group. Um, it's just an open, welcoming environment or people who recognize that they have some lived experience with a mood challenge. And um, peer support is grounded in mutuality, which means there's no power differential between me and my peers. I am a certified peer specialist, but I'm not the expert. So um, as I'm working with my peers, we are coming together we're connecting, we're relating based on our shared lived experience with mood disorders. And the fact that we have that shared uh, lived experience just deepens the authenticity of the connections that we make. But that mutuality means, um, you know, when we go to see the psychiatrist, there's absolutely a power differential yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, right. We can quite often feel like, the doctor has all the power, yes. and I have very yes. little power. It's not like that in peer support. We're coming together. We're learning from each other and growing together. Yeah. So that's what peer support is all about. It's people coming together. Um, you know, I get to share my recovery story, lessons that I've learned along the way, because I was diagnosed in 1985. I have a lot of skin in the game um, you know 1985 yes i think that's when i was diagnosed yep am i right yes 1985 because 1981 i graduated i was 17 18 and then four more years as i was 21 at the same time wow now were you ever in a mental institution or yes i've been hospitalized oh wow tell Absolutely. me that experience um Some people um, have inpatient hospitalizations and they have a good experience. Personally, I feel like mental hospitals are coming up very short. Mm -hmm. Um, People have a good amount of trauma oftentimes Mm -hmm. when they are discharged from the mental health hospital. So, you know, the hospitals are supposed to be there for crisis stabilization. Right. So if a person is in crisis, that's where you go to get the help. 
that you need to get your life back on track. But um, my experience was a lot of tweaking uh, with my medication, and this is just my personal experience. I've always had great um, health insurance, so I just always kind of felt like they'd keep you as long as you, <laughs> you No, but you're right. Health insurance you're right. coverage. And then, you know, like amazingly, when your days of coverage ended, okay, <laughs> you're discharged. And, you know, you're sent back home to all of the stressors or responsibilities yeah. that you had in your life with not really a transition plan or... I just think there's a lot of room for improvement with um, inpatient hospitalization in this country. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, you know, I I don't, I got to be honest, um, and I don't blame my mom and dad because they didn't know. Right. And they put me in there, but it was two and a half weeks of, of really not, it was just, you know, if you're a bad boy, they throw you in the seclusion room and you're tied up from your you know, your wrist, your ankles, and your and your waist. And you're in there with four four walls and a you know, one bed. It's scary. And it, it I think it just traumatized the, the, it just traumatized you more. And and like I said, I lost, you know, thirty pounds. So I knew that I had to escape. So the first time they let me, <laughs> this is in my book, first time they let me for a walk, because I knew I was going to go for a walk the next day, I had to, I had to trade shoes, I trade uh, my tennis shoes for hard shoes and a leather jacket. So it was just a, a trade that I did so I could wear tennis shoes. And they just, I walked one door, another door, another door, and I'm outside, and they're talking, the two nurses, the girl and a a guy. And I just ran up the hill, kept running. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I knew I had to go. So I escaped. Cops were after me. But because of what we're talking about, it it wasn't good for me, no matter how you put it. It, You know, I, I know if you're violent. Right. You have to be throwing in, you know, the, these, th- these places. But in my probably your condition, my condition, it, it wasn't needed. Maybe it was needed for a day. I don't know. But uh, um, but then again, it's all for a reason, right? Well, um, you know, when people go into mental health crisis, the there are times that they need a higher level of care. Yes. So you can need that yes. crisis level care. Um, just, it seems to me there's a lot of force that goes on um, in inpatient psychiatric hospitalizations. And I'm not a proponent of force. No. No. I don't think people um, get better no. that way. No. Um, I sure didn't. It took me about eight months, nine months of depression. Because when you're, you're manic, as you know, you got to come down. Then my thing is, that's why I don't like, I don't want, I don't want, some people don't, they, they, they like the highs, right? right? Of being, you know, I, I, yeah, it was, it's kind of cool, you know, but it's not like the coolest thing ever. But I know when I come down, it's, it's torture. Yeah. You know, you want to stay in bed. I call the bed quicksand because it just, you just don't want to get out of bed. And I was depressed for like eight, nine months, but I, I keep talking about this because it's all, a lot of it's mental. Okay. Because I was depressed for about eight months and I'm not going to get into this whole contest that I, that I entered this, the most watchful man in America. Okay. I won the most watchful man in Contra Costa. Mm-hmm. And I won the most watched man in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. No, I didn't win in Contra Costa. I got third place. So I go to the, the after I uh, escaped from the hospital, I had eight months. And I, I thought that they postponed the, the, thankfully, they postponed the contest. So I got to enter and I won. And guess what? I'm better. I mean, I was horrible for like eight months. Uh, 
I win this thing. And now mentally, I'm not 100% better, but right. it was like that. And I said, I don't need my pills. I don't want I don't I feel great. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it's a lot of it's mental. Well, we have to understand that. Um, boy, you got me off track here. Well, that, that speaks to resilience, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I have facilitated DBSA support groups. I started attending DBSA support groups as a participant probably 20 years ago. Oh, really? And um, then I got trained to be a DBSA um support group facilitator, and I facilitated DBSA support groups for about five years. Then I was elected chapter president of my local DBSA chapter. And in all of these years of participating and facilitating DBSA support groups, people come to groups and they share stories of um, adversity, yes. darkness, despair. Yeah. Um, but people keep getting back up, and that speaks to the resilience of the human spirit, you know, fundamentally. Yeah. But people with lived experience with uh, mood disorders, particularly, just have a lot of resilience. You know, the the condition will come along and knock you down but people continue to get back up yes. and keep fighting. You know, we're fighting for our lives, essentially. Yeah, and, and I keep, because a lot of it's, you know, with me is I, I, God, and, and I, you know, the la I think the last one during the pandemic, I was like, I've already been through enough. <laughs> Come on, God, why do I have to go through another one? Right. It, it's just, how many do I have to go through here? But you have to go through as many as you need to go through. And then you got to learn to get better. Because if you don't, like, if you don't get, learn the, 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 the triggers or whatever it is that, that help you, you'll continue to fall. Exactly. But you do have hope. I'm a proven fact. You're a proven fact. Michael Pollock is a proof of fact. Michael Pollock. Well, uh, uh, um, Ernest Hemingway in uh, A Farewell to Arms, he had this line in there about we are stronger at the broken places. Yeah. And I think um, living beautiful. with a mood disorder is it's a tremendous benefit because, like, when the pandemic hit, um, isolation and loneliness set in on people who had no prior yes. lived experience with yes. a mental health condition. But those of us who had lived experience with mood disorders, we already knew about yeah. isolation, uh, darkness, right. despair, um, and that resilience was kind of part of our superpower. So I observed people with lived experience, uh, particularly with mood disorders, um, fare okay during the pandemic. Yeah, here's, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I, I always say that, can you imagine the people who have never experienced anxiety or depression or, and now it's the first time? Yeah. Woo! Now, for me, the problem was, I had a lot come at me at once. And I always say it's like gears in the car, you know, for four speed. You have your first gear, second gear, third. I, you always want to stay in first, second gear. You don't want to, you can go to third. Don't want to go to fourth, really. Don't go to fifth and sixth, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, I was kind of in third. So when my mom and dad moved out of my house, it wasn't a great experience. Pandemic hit. I, it's like the end of the world. Paula came in to me and said, uh, we're not going to New York to promote the book. And they're shutting down General Hospital. I felt a rush in my body. After that, that night, I was shaking like a leaf. It's never happened to me. 
and all my breakdowns and everything. I've never sh shaken, and I couldn't sleep. I wasn't sleeping, and I had to get up early in the morning to do Zooms about the book and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was, I always say about all this, keep your pressure level down. And that's what I've been trying to do, whether it means don't yell or don't do this or don't do that. Keep the pressure down. So if something does happen, you're all right because you've only lifted a bit. Right. Because if you're here, you're done. That's what it was with me. And that was four months after that of, of just terrible stuff. Well, you know, um, are you familiar with the Wellness Recovery Action Plan? I've heard. Plan? Okay, so um, Mary Ellen Copeland created the Wellness Recovery Action Plan, so the acronym is RAP, W-R-A-P, so it's a RAP plan. So when you're completing your RAP plan, you're essentially journaling about how your mood disorder shows up or how it manifests, so you're looking at... Like, what do I look like when I'm well? What do I look like when I'm not well? What are the early warning signs that yeah. I'm starting not to do well? Yeah. So that's like, what is going on with me in my body and with my behavior? And then what are your triggers? Those are like external stressors or external yeah. life events. And then you identify who is in your support system. So who can you count on? And then what does it look like when things are actually breaking apart? And the last piece is a crisis. You put together a crisis plan and then a post-crisis plan. Well, so to that point about the triggers, we have no control over external life stressors. No. Sometimes life just shows up yes. in a really chaotic yes. way. And whether you have a mood disorder or not, life will show up sometimes in ways that will just rock us. Yes. Um, the benefit of completing your wellness recovery action plan is that you kind of give thought to what you recognize to be your personal triggers, and you come up with an action plan for the next time this trigger pops up in my life, this is how I'm going to react or respond Oh. But we don't have the ability to control our no. life stressors from showing up. And so what you just described was like a period in your life that was a perfect storm yes. of stressors that yes. just all came together at, at the, the same, same time. time. Yeah, That can very well happen to any of us. Yeah. But I would hope, because the way I'm feeling, that if it did happen exactly the same, I wouldn't respond the same or re you know it, it wouldn't take me down so bad absolutely and i and i and i'm i have hope in that and i think we all should have hope that it, when we go through things if it does happen again we'll deal with it better and it won't be hit as hard well absolutely um hope is foundational to recovery and, you know, if my recovery journey goes back to 1985, it sounds like yours does as well. I've learned a tremendous and, uh, amount about myself, um, about this mood disorder, about how my mood disorder shows up, what it looks like. Um, and I know what to pay attention to yes, early on. Yes. Um, and so m the benefit of me completing my wellness recovery action plan is that I've, I have come to recognize like my own pattern of unraveling mm. and it has helped me avert full blown mental health crisis yeah. episodes. Um, this has been amazing. Uh, yeah, I feel like I want you to ask me a couple questions, whatever you want to ask me. Okay, um, how, uh, how have you figured out how to balance um, all of the things that go on in your life? Because you're, you're on stage, yeah. you're on set. Good question. Um, you have those responsibilities. And so now you've added this new um, uh, responsibility of being a mental health advocate and yeah. you're 
speaking out vocally about your own lived experience. So how do you keep things in balance to stay in a good place of mental well-being? Um, it's really trying to stay in the moment and staying out of my thoughts, the, bad, the, the thoughts that come to me. I try to, I try to just stay with pos- everything positive. Um, because it's really, for me, it's one thing that has happened since the pandemic, and I talk about it quite a lot, is I'm really learning and working on not caring what people think. And that has given me like wings, like a bird (laughs) to fly. Because I, you know, my whole life, that's been the, even with all, you know, being in the mental, it's now I'm thinking in my head, oh, everybody thinks I'm a failure. Right. Now I am in a mental institution. I didn't make it as an actor. And now this and that. It's always been this thing. But in the, since the pandemic, I've been working on um, not having those thoughts and staying truly in the moment. And it's just beautiful to feel this way. It really is. Um, and I think it has to do with when you when you when you're looking at death or thinking about death and you and you say to yourself you're going to live i think you do get rewarded that's all i'll say about that well um i want to applaud you um you know you're a public personality um you came out publicly yeah. about your diagnosis and there's um i for uh, i'm a publicly disclosing person that i live with a mood disorder um i know for me personally it's from a place of privilege that i could come out and do that because i work for myself so like i can't be fired or yeah. demoted or lose work because of doing that but you calculated the risk and decided that you wanted to come out publicly and I really admire the work that you're doing with the podcast so it's like I see you Maurice (laughs) you're doing you're doing good stuff and you know so I think when we come out publicly um, we're helping to eradicate the stigma because then you give people a face to look at when they look at Maurice hey you know he's He's doing good over there. Yeah, yeah. That's what living with the mood disorder looks like. Then it's not scary no. or it's not threatening. And I'm trying to do that, particularly in the black community. You know, we need more people to come out and raise their hand and say, hey, this is part of my lived experience. It's just a part of who I am. And I've been a fairly successful person. I had a 25-year successful career in human resources management, and I'm a retired HR manager, and now everything that I do is in the mental health realm, but um, my mood disorder is not getting in the way in any manner of me showing up at my best in all of my responsibilities and relationships in life. Well, like I said, you're an angel. Um, and what does DBSA mean to you? That's my last question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I found my way to recovery really through attending DBSA support groups. Wow. So I have so much um, love and admiration for the organization. Um, DBSA is, it provides. Um, a safe, welcoming space for people who have that shared lived experience with mood disorders to come together, to connect, to share sometimes some of their most vulnerable experiences, thoughts, and feelings, and then to support each other. Um, And when you see that peer support in action, it is just the most beautiful thing. Peer support is um, kind of defined as an augment to traditional mental health care. Yeah. Um, but in my opinion, it's superior 
to traditional mental health care um, because it's it's real. Yeah, uh, people come to peer support groups and they talk about having family members who don't understand their right. experience, who don't get it. But everybody who comes to a DBSA peer support group, we understand. We've been there. We've lived, yeah. you know, the walk. The, we've had our own recovery journey. We've been through the highs and the lows. And so um, there's just nothing more affirming than a peer support group. And DBSA is really the premier organization in this country providing free mental I health know. care support groups. And um, the work that they do is just awesome. All right, listen, uh, I've kept you long enough. You've been fantastic. Uh, I think part one and part two, you guys have to see this because it, it educates people. It's going to help people. And uh, I'm just honored. It's and been my honor to be here. It's just, that's all I can say, and I'm wiped the hell out at this point. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.